our guest today is Al Glenn. Hi, Al. How are you? Very well, thanks. Very well. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's nice to have you here. Um, I was going to introduce you, but can you introduce yourself and give us an idea of basically where you fit into the scheme of things? Sure. So, um, kia ora koutou. Uh, so, my name's Al Glenn, and I'm a, a wildlife ecologist at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Um, you might pick up a bit of an Australian accent, um, but I've been living and working in New Zealand now for just over 10 years. Um, and I work on a variety of different things, but um, most of the, the research I do involves invasive animals um, and particularly predators like um, cats and mustelids um, and methods for, for monitoring those species. So that's what I'll be talking about today. So that's great. So there we go. Monica Peters, as you'll see down there, Al, is saying hi, baby good from the wet and windy <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> well, thanks, Monica. It's a perfect day to be watching this webinar. So it's all yours. I sit back and take us through the slides that are now appearing on the bigger part of this uh, screen. Thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. So. Um, I'll just start off by giving you a quick run through of what I plan to, to cover in this presentation. Um, I'll start off by describing what uh, camera traps are and some of the, the things that they, they can be useful for. Um, and then I'll go on to talk about some of the, the research that I've been working with um, along with various uh, collaborators, both here in New Zealand and uh, back in Australia, um, which is looking at um, using artificial intelligence to enhance the, the usefulness of, of cameras for wildlife monitoring. So first of all, just to, to show everybody what a camera trap actually is. Um, a lot of you probably use camera traps, but some of you might not be familiar. So on the, the right hand side of the screen, there is a, a picture of a, a fairly typical camera trap. And basically all they are is a, is a conventional digital camera, but with a, a motion sensor on them. So that sort of rectangular object you can see down towards the bottom of the, the camera body is an infrared motion sensor, much the same as you would find on a, a home burglar alarm or a, or a sensor light. So when an animal walks in front of the, the camera, the, the animal's body heat and motion triggers that, that motion sensor and gets the camera to take um, a photo or in some cases a, a video. Um, a lot of the different camera models have a choice of either still still images or, or video. Um, directly above that motion sensor, right pretty much in the center of the camera body, you can see the, the lens there. And then above that, there's an array of LED lights which serve as the, the camera's flash. Um, in, in the case of this model, those are uh, LED, those are infrared LEDs, which um, most cameras use. But you can also get uh, cameras that that have a white flash as well. And there are literally thousands of different models of camera trap on the market, and new ones coming out all the time. So that the the range um, of models and features is is absolutely bewildering. But um, but most of them work on much the same principle. Um, like most technologies, they've been coming down in, in price over the last 10, 15 years. So they're becoming increasingly widely used uh, by research um, organisations, conservation organisations and community groups uh, all over the world really for monitoring wildlife. And they can detect a, a very wide range of different animal species. So I've just got a, a few examples there at the bottom of the screen of some of the, the critters that I've been using cameras for monitoring uh, here here in New Zealand. So we've got a, a stoat, a ferret and a, a feral cat in that uh, particular example. But one of the, the more recent uh, developments is that we are starting to use camera traps for monitoring those relatively small species like uh, stoats. So the, these cameras were originally developed with much larger animals in mind. And most of the, the studies until, until very recently have been on um, big animals like deer and big cats and, and so on. 
And there are just a few differences in the way you need to set up your, your camera trap if you want to study smaller species. So you can see here in the uh, the picture of the, the deer that the, the animals are actually a, a reasonable distance away from the camera and that the camera's got quite a, wild, a wide field of view there. Um, if a, a small animal like a rat or a stoat were to run across that field of view, there's a pretty good chance that they wouldn't even trigger the camera's motion sensor because they might be too far away from it. Um, and even if they do trigger it and a photograph is taken, it might be very difficult to identify the, a, a very small animal in that um, quite large field of view there. So instead, when we're, we're targeting small species, um, we set our cameras much closer to the, the focal area that we're interested in. And here are a few examples uh, on your screen now. Um, so we tend to set our cameras about one and a half meters away um, from the, the focal area where we want the animal to be. And then we use a, a lure to actually encourage the animal to, to approach that spot and hopefully pause at least for a second or two, often longer, um, so that we've got a good chance of getting clearly identifiable photographs. Um, a lot of people ask what the lure is that we use. So you, you can see in those uh, photos or in, in three of those photos anyway, a, a white plastic um, pottle. And inside that we've got um, ferret body odour, which we've found is a spectacularly um, effective lure for a whole range of, of different species. So a few of the, the neat things that uh, camera traps can be used for. One is that uh, if you're lucky enough to be working on a species that has unique um, markings, you can actually do a, a mark recapture study in exactly the same way as you would with live trapping where you might attach ear tags or, or some other type of mark to an animal. Um, and so this is actually how the, the term camera trap came about because people started using them exactly like you would a, a live trap and using them to estimate population numbers. Uh, and the first species that that was, was done for was uh, tigers, as in this example here, because each uh, each cat has its own individual markings. But sim similar things have been done for a, a range of other species that have individual um, identifiable markings. Um, even when it comes to animals that, that don't necessarily have unique um, markings, cameras can still be very useful for getting an index of population numbers and also for um, studying the species distribution. So on the screen now, I've got an example from one of our research projects. This is the, the Cape to City program in Hawke's Bay, which some of you might be familiar with. It's a, a large scale uh, predator control program across mostly farmland and uh, peri-urban areas just south of um, the town of uh, Hastings in, in Hawke's Bay. Uh, and here I've just produced a, a heat map showing detections of feral cats on camera traps. So each of those little coloured circles on the map there is the location of one of our cameras um, and it's color coded so the green circles are, are cameras that didn't detect any cats um, and then orange is one or two cats and then through to to bright red for cameras that detected quite large numbers of cats so you can even though you can't estimate the actual population number you can get some feel for whether you've got more or less cats in one area than another um, and which areas are more likely to have cats than others. So um, a very, very useful tool in that regard. And camera traps can also be very useful for studying animal behavior. Um, so ev every time a camera takes a photograph, it, it marks it with a date and timestamp. So you know exactly when that animal was detected, which can be really neat for uh, studying uh, temporal activity patterns of species. So this graph here is a, an example from some research by my colleague Patrick Garvey. Um, again, this was in Hawke's Bay and he was studying the, the temporal activity patterns of 
cats, ferrets and stoats all in the, the same area. Uh, so if you look at these three graphs, in, in each case, the uh, the solid black line shows the, the temporal activity of the, the larger predator out of each pair, and the dashed blue line is the smaller predator. So on the top one, we've got cats as the black line and ferrets as the the dashed blue line. And you can see that their activity patterns through the course of the day were actually very similar. They had, I think from memory, almost 90% overlap in their activity patterns, or so both predominantly uh, nocturnal. Uh, but then the, the middle of those three graphs shows cats compared to stoats, which are um, the smallest predator in this assemblage. And there you can see that they actually have pretty much an opposite activity pattern. So that the stoats in the dash blue line were active almost entirely during the daytime um, with a, a bare minimum of overlap with cats. And then again, the, the third graph there, that's uh, stoats compared to ferrets. And again, absolute minimum of, of overlap between the two. So it, it suggests that stoats are actually avoiding the two larger predators by being active during the daytime, um, whereas their, their, their larger competitors are, are active at night. Um, and interestingly, stoats in New Zealand can be anywhere from completely nocturnal through to completely diurnal or anywhere in between. So it's not just a, a hardwired thing that stoats are active in the daytime. Um, it's just in this particular uh, system, um, they are active in the day and, as I say, probably as a way of avoiding the, the two larger competitors. Another uh, behavioural um, type of behavioural study that cameras can be very useful for is identifying nest predators. So I've got a few examples here. One is uh, an example from Australia of a, a goanna raiding the, the nest of a, a ground nesting bird. Um, but then the, the two uh, black and white photographs underneath that, um, which are, were provided by my, my colleague Grant Norbury, um, were taken from braided riverbeds on the, the South Island here in New Zealand. And you can clearly see there a feral cat and a hedgehog, uh, both raiding the nests of, of ground nesting birds. Uh, and this is really neat because un until camera traps came along, hedgehogs pretty much tended to fly under the, the radar. Everybody was aware that, that um, things like cats and mustelids were bad news for native birds. Um, but it actually turns out from camera trapping studies that hedgehogs are one of the main predators of uh, ground nesting birds in these braided river systems. So pretty important finding. Okay, so that's a, a bit of a, an overview of the, the sorts of things that, that uh, camera traps can be very useful for. Um, but unfortunately, there is a bit of a downside for them, which is that uh, although cameras are fantastic for detecting the, the wildlife species that we're interested in, that motion sensor can also be triggered by livestock, as you can see in that photo there of the, the sheep, uh, or they can even be triggered by just grass or branches blowing in the breeze. So even if that sheep wasn't there in the photograph, you can also see that towards the, the edge of the screen, there's some quite long grass and there's also a flax bush in the background. And if those were blowing around in the breeze, that could be enough to trigger the camera. And you can end up with literally thousands and thousands of photographs of nothing, um, which is extremely time consuming and expensive to, to process manually. So as an example, uh, last year we had a, a camera trap deployment just only for a few weeks where we got 2.3 million images and the vast majority of those were just junk images of either livestock or just grass blowing in the breeze and it took an unbelievably long time to, to process those. So it really not not time or cost efficient at all. But luckily the, the solution is on the way and that is to use artificial intelligence to analyze the, the animals in, in the photographs and identify them automatically. So I've been collaborating with a guy in Australia called Greg Falzon from the University of New England. And a few years ago, Greg developed some uh, 
artificial intelligence software for identifying a range of Australian wildlife species in, in camera trap uh, photographs. So I've been working with Greg to adapt that uh, technology and identify some of the species that we uh, get here in New Zealand, including uh, guys like you see on the screen there, stoats, um, hedgehogs, and some of our native species as well, including kiwi. Uh, so the, the software works in, in two steps. It firstly, we'll filter out all the, the junk images. So for example, things like sheep and cattle and grass blowing in the breeze. And it'll just put those into one folder, which it just calls uh, false triggers. And you, you don't even have to look at those. So straight away, that's saving you potentially 90 or more percent of your processing time um, to identify what's in the, in the photographs. Um, but then even better still, the artificial intelligence can take that percentage of the photographs that do have wildlife species in them and actually identify those to species. So at the moment, we've got it to a stage where we're getting roughly 80 to 90% accuracy in identifying uh, New Zealand species in, in photographs. And uh, depending on which species it is, so some for some species it's more accurate than others. And that accuracy will continue to improve. We're confident we'll get that up to well over 95% um, for all the, the range of species that we're interested in. So this is just an example of um, a beta version of some, some software that Greg produced for us. And some, it's a program called Classify Me. Um, it was originally developed for Australian species. Um, it's also been adapted for a range of South African species and most recently for a range of New Zealand species. Um, this software can just run on a, a standard uh, PC. You don't need any sort of supercomputer to, to run it. And unlike me, it can process thousands of images per hour. So it's, it's very fast. The, the current version, we, we started with a just a, a very fairly narrow range of species um, to begin with for the, for the AI to recognize. So at the moment, um, it can recognize cats, um, it classes stoats and weasels together just as stoats because um, they're so similar that it's it's very difficult to tell those apart. Um, it recognises hedgehogs. And then when it comes to birds, it we have trained it to recognise kiwi, but any, any other bird at all, anything from a, a turkey through to a, a fantail will just be put into a category of other birds. Um, it would be possible in future to, to train it to recognise other species as well, but kiwi were our, our first priority, um, partly because uh, the funding for doing this came from a, a kiwi conservation uh, grant. Um, it also recognises livestock. It just lumps sheep and cattle together into one category, livestock, and of course the false triggers, things like uh, grass blowing in the wind, and just chucks those into a folder that you don't have to worry about. And next, I've just taken a few screenshots of the, the software in operation just to give you a, a feel for how it works. So I, I just uploaded half a dozen images in this case with just examples of different species. Um, and to analyze these, all you have to do is, well, first of all, um, you'll see in the, the top right hand corner of that screenshot, it says New Zealand. You, you do have to tell it to use the New Zealand model, otherwise it might use the, the South African model and tell you that your, your feral cat is really a, a lion or something. Um, so that's that's the first trick for young players. But then it's just a simple case of clicking the, the load button that you can see in the bottom left there, navigating to the, the folder where you have your images stored, which in most cases would just be the, the memory card that you've taken directly out of the camera trap and in, inserted into the, the card reader of your computer. Uh, and then you click that classify button next to it. And there's a little green progress bar there that chugs along. And when it's finished, it goes ping. And you can see there in the in the little text box, it says classification of six images complete. And it gives you two different types of output. 
So the, the first output is a copy of each individual image where the artificial intelligence has drawn a box around the, the animal in the photograph and um, then says what it is. So you, you can see there, or hopefully you can see on the screen um, that it says bird, hedgehog, kiwi, cat, and so on. Uh, the, the photograph there in the middle right, I deliberately uh, included one photograph that didn't have an animal in it and um, you can see there that the AI has correctly realized that there's nothing there. Um, the, the second output is what you can see next to it, just a, a simple spreadsheet which has um, two, two columns. So each row um, in the spreadsheet represents one image and it simply tells you the, the image file name and then in, next to it in the right hand column the species identification and a confidence estimate for that identification. So you can see there that the, the AI was 85 to 90 percent confident in all of those identifications. Uh, one thing that we want to, to look at is uh, whether there's a, a threshold for that uh, confidence rating where it might be a good idea to have a a human being actually go back and review those photos and just check um, for the accuracy. So it might be, we might decide, for example, that anything below 80% should be double checked by a human, but that's that's something that we're, we're yet, to, uh, yet to look at. So that's where we're up to um, with the, the software so far, but this is uh, ongoing research. So, um, the next thing that, that we're working on is to test and refine that the accuracy of that species ID. And as I said, we're, we're pretty confident that we'll get um, up into the high 90% for, for the full range of species that we're interested in. Um, and the way we're doing that is simply to provide the, the artificial intelligence with much larger sample sizes of example images. Um, so the, the current version was trained with only a few hundred images of each species, I think from memory four to 500 images of each, which is not a, a huge sample size. Um, but over the past year or two, we've been working on collating an enormous um, library of, of sample images. And we, we aim to have at least 10,000, in some cases a lot more than 10,000 images of each species, but not only that, uh, 10,000 of each species at night time when the, the cameras use the infrared flash and take a, a black and white photograph. Um, and then another 10,000 images uh, in the daytime when the cameras take a color photograph because that does um, affect the, the, um, the image recognition. Uh, so with these very large sample sizes, we're confident that we'll get very high accuracy in the identification. Um, the other thing that we're doing is adding a, a bunch more species. Um, so those include uh, possums. Um, it will recognize rabbits and hares, but um, like like stoats and weasels, they're, they're pretty similar looking. So it's just going to lump those together into one category, which it'll just call lagomorphs. Um, it'll recognize ferrets. Uh, rats and mice, we're yet to decide whether it will identify those separately or just class them together as rodents, but um, it looks very promising that it, it will actually be able to distinguish rats and mice, which is going to be very useful. Uh, and we also want to add uh, wild pigs and also dogs. And the other exciting development is that we're collaborating with the guys at trap.nz. And again, many of you might be familiar with this website. It's a very useful website for recording and analyzing trapping data. Um, it's quite widely used by community groups around New Zealand. There are well over 2000 uh, projects that, that use TrapNZ. Um, and you can see there on the screenshot a few examples of the sorts of things that it can do. So um, you can map the locations of all your traps or bait stations. Um, there's a, a smartphone app where you can actually record the locations of, of your devices and what you catch in them uh, as, you, as you're checking them. Um, and then you can produce heat maps like you can see on the right hand side there showing uh, where 
species tend to be detected uh, most often. But the uh, exciting development is that uh, the guys at TrapNZ have, have just added the capability for this website to handle camera trap data. So I've just set up an example uh, project here, which once again is the Cape to City project in Hawke's Bay. And what you can see on the map there is a, a dot for the location of each one of our camera traps in that area. So what you can now do is uh, go to any one of those camera traps and actually upload the, the images that have come from that camera and they'll, they'll be stored on the TrapNZ website. Uh, at the at the moment, the the identification of the species in those images uh, will still have to be done manually. But in some cases, that might actually be a very good thing because it's it's a neat opportunity for some citizen science and some public engagement. So you can upload your images to the website and then have uh, volunteers go through those images and identify what's in them. Um, and that can be a particularly neat thing for things like school projects. So um, I gather we might have some school groups watching today. That might be something you, you might want to consider doing. Uh, but the other thing that we're working on is actually integrating artificial intelligence, um, like I've just described with the Classify Me software, into this TrapNZ platform. So users in in the hopefully very near future, will actually have the choice of doing manual identification of their images or um, use the artificial intelligence to identify them. Or indeed, you can do both, which is especially neat because that means that if, if the artificial intelligence does make errors, there's the potential for uh, human users to correct those errors. And we can even improve the, the accuracy of the artificial intelligence further. Um, so that's that's where we're headed with that, um, as I say, hopefully in the, the very near future. Um, and finally, I just want to talk about some of the, the neat things that uh, some of our other collaborators around New Zealand are, are working on. And the first example is the Cacophony Project, who've been working with thermal cameras as opposed to conventional uh, cameras. And with the their early testing, depending on the, the target species, they've found that thermal cameras can be anywhere between three and 50 times more sensitive than a conventional camera, which is pretty exciting. Um, and you can see from that screenshot on the right there um, that their, their artificial intelligence works in quite a similar way to the, the stuff that we've been developing, where the software first identifies that there is an animal there, draws a box around it, um, and then comes up with an identification and a confidence rating. So in that example, it's a possum and it, it rates it out of 10. So it's 9.1 out of 10 confident that that is a, a possum. So that's a, a pretty neat uh, bit of technology that's being developed at the moment. And finally, something that, that we want to work on over the next few years is to develop what we're calling smart traps. Um, and this is, the concept is based on something that, again, my, my colleague Greg Falzon at University of New England has already developed, which is called Wild Dog Alert. So that the top uh, photograph there is a, um, a picture of the, the Wild Dog Alert uh, camera. And you can see it's a tripod mounted camera that actually has a, a 360 degree view all, all around it. Uh, and this device actually has the, the artificial intelligence uh, on, on board. So it doesn't have to send the images up to a cloud to get an identification. It just it does that on board. And if it detects a wild dog, um, you can see in the, the photograph in the bottom, it, uh, same, same as classify me, it draws a, a box around it, says that's a dog, and it will instantly send a text message or an email to the landholder to, to alert them that a wild dog has been detected on their property, uh, which is very useful for sheep farmers um, who don't like their, their sheep being uh, torn apart by wild dogs. Uh, so we're looking at taking a, a, a similar approach, but applying that to 
either live capture traps or potentially even kill traps uh, for catching invasive species as part of the, the predator free New Zealand initiative. So the, the first step in this process would be for a smart trap simply to um, identify any non-target species and immediately disarm itself so that it becomes harmless. Um, so for example, there are lots of areas where use of um, kill traps is problematic because there might be uh, ground dwelling birds like kiwi or weka present and it, obviously we don't want to be harming those species and that makes it very difficult to control predators in those areas. Um, but if, if we had a, a smart trap that could instantly disarm as soon as it sees that it's been approached by a, a kiwi or a weka, then we could safely put those right throughout um, habitat of those um, endangered species and, and hopefully achieve much more effective predator control in those areas. Uh, but the next step that we want to incorporate is for the smart trap uh, not only to disarm when it sees a non-target species, but to actually deploy species appropriate lures when it detects a target species. So for example, when it uh, detects a cat approaching, it might make a sound or squirt out a little bit of a scent lure that is known to be attractive to cats. Um, whereas if it sees a rat approaching, it might use a completely different lure or combination of lures to try and uh, attract that that rat into the into the trap so potentially we could get much higher effectiveness and across a wider range of predator species um, and finally for those really really difficult to trap animals um, we we might be able to develop this artificial intelligence to the point where the trap can identify a target species and actually trigger itself without the animal having to touch anything. So at the moment, most traps work by the target animal either stepping on a, a tread plate or um, tugging on a, on a piece of bait to, to actually trigger the trap mechanism. Um, but there's potential here for an animal that just happens to be walking past and not touching anything to be captured, um, which could be very useful for just getting those last few animals that seem to refuse to, to go into a, a conventional trap. Uh, so those are, those are the sorts of things that we're hoping to develop over the next um, few years. And hopefully those will help us to, to push along the, the predator-free New Zealand initiative quite significantly. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. And I'll be uh, happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Al. That was brilliant. That's very cool. As Sonia put, just as she just sent a wee note to us saying, "Exciting," and it is very exciting. <laughs> you must be um, great. You know, it's is is this happening happening rapidly enough for you? You're finding that the technology and the people working on it, it's quickening. The more they're learning, the more they're doing. It it is speeding up very much. So, I mean, it it, it can't happen. Uh, fast enough. It, um, we want it last year, really. But um, mm. yeah, it is rapidly gaining momentum. And um, I, I mentioned that the Cacophony project a moment ago. Um, one of the things that that Grant Ryan, who's the the um, the impresario of the the Cacophony project, one of the things that he likes to talk about is is Moore's law, which is the the law that with any new technology, as time goes on, the the price falls dramatically and the the capability rises dramatically and that's absolutely what we're we're seeing so um yeah these these sorts of devices that i've been talking about at the moment at prototype stage that they're, they're pretty expensive but i can see um quite quite plausibly that within five years they could be um mass produced cheap and and probably better than they they already are um, I've had quite a few questions and they're quite broad, you know, they're from all different angles. There's obviously some questions from people that are very already engaged in this area and others that are really starting out. So I thought I'm going to sort of go from one side to another. First, from the start out point of view, um, if somebody's just wanting to get into the space, they want to go out, they haven't got a lot of um, uh, money in their group and they just want to get a camera online, um, what do you recommend to these people? How do they go about this? Mm, yeah, great, great question. And that's that's the 
question I most often get asked. Um, so the, the great news is that, um, again, Moore's Law, camera traps are coming down in price and getting better all the time. So a few years ago, you had to spend oh, a good six or eight hundred dollars to get a, a decent camera trap. Um, there are now very good ones out there for less than two hundred dollars. So you, you don't have to spend the earth. Um, there are even some moderately okay ones for around a hundred dollars. Um, as I said at the start, there are new models coming out constantly, so it's it's really not possible to rec recommend a a specific model. Um, the the most recent one I bought is already out of production. So, um, but what I always recommend to people is to go to a, a website that's called trailcampro dot com. So just all one word, Trailcam Pro. Um, and those guys sell virtually every brand of camera trap um, there is. So they, they don't have a vested interest in selling you one particular type. They'll give you honest advice about the pros and cons of different models and the, the cost effectiveness of it, depending on your purpose. Um, and it does depend very much on your purpose. So what, what type of animals do you want to study? Are they big and slow moving or are they small and fast? Um, do you need uh, still photographs or video? So if, you, if you're, for example, looking at nest predation studies, you'll probably want video. But if you're just interested in detecting presence or absence, all you need is, is still photographs. Um, so it is, it's very much horses for courses, but yeah, you don't have to spend the earth and um, you can, Whatever your purpose is, you'll be able to find a, a camera that will suit it for two or three hundred dollars. Someone did ask earlier about um, the technology side with video, whether they'll be able to be um, uploaded and sorted out through your technology soon. Um, mm. At the moment, it's just stills. Is that correct? That's right. It is just stills. And um, a, a disclaimer here. So I'm I'm just a dumb ecologist. I don't actually understand the the software um, at all. Mm. But um, Greg, uh, my collaborator, tells me that the 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 basics of the the Im image recognition process are quite different for video compared to to still images. So the the particular software that he's developed for us will only do stills um, but I have I have seen similar products um, in fact I, I saw one on Twitter only this morning that a, um, a friend of mine was was playing around with um, similar products that that do the same thing for video so um, they are out there um, and in fact that that cacophony um, software that I mentioned um, with the thermal cameras that that works on video is a technical question um, asking how does classify me deal with multiple species in one photo example mm. of livestock and rat yeah um, Greg tells me that it, it can cope with that I've actually never come across an image that that has more than one species in it but I, I did ask Greg and he said yes it, it will um, it will cope with that and identify them both separately um, I have come across instances where there's more than one of the same species in the photo and it it deals with that so I've, I've seen photos where there are for example two rats or two possums um, in the image and it draws a box around each one and identifies them separately um, and yeah it will do the same for say uh, yeah a rat and a, a sheep or, or whatever Freeman asks um, good question you know can you just talk a little bit more about the thermal traps and and who makes them sure um, so the, the example I mentioned were the Cacophony Project. And if you, if you just um, Google Cacophony Project New Zealand, you'll, you'll find them very easily. Um, so they're, they're based uh, just outside Christchurch in the South Island, and they're working on a, a whole range of high technology um, solutions for predator-free New Zealand, um, including monitoring devices like, like that thermal camera, um, they're also looking at bird song recording devices um, and smart smart traps. So they're, they're doing a lot of um, very neat work. Here's one from Rob. He asks, for pest fence sanctuaries, mice often interfere with detection uh, devices targeting rats. Can your AI technology differentiate between rats and mice? 
it, it looks promising from from early testing. Um, yeah, Greg Greg has tried it out on a small sample and said yeah, it got most of them right. So I'm reasonably confident that once we've trained it up with these huge um, sample sizes of of um, of images, that it will be able to differentiate. Yeah. Also, thanks to the people that are putting some of the websites that you mentioned or names in our uh, chat box. Oh, yeah, see, when the company there, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, which is really great. And that means that when uh, we play this back, um, you know, when you when it's put on our website, uh, Predator Free New Zealand Trust website, um, you'll be able to go back and, and watch it again and get those details, which is really cool. Um, I had another one here. Um, Chris just asked, is the AI the same as the technology they use in the pause project? Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with pause, but I don't know what the underlying AI platform is. Um, I suspect it's probably quite different because they're identifying um, footprint images on a, on a touch screen whereas ours is actually looking at, at photographs. I suspect they're probably quite different, but I, I couldn't actually say for sure. Um, here's one from Julia. Within New Zealand, how well does Classify Me generalise to images from new camera trap locations compared to images from camera trap locations on which it was trained? That's a fairly technical question. Mm, yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, so, yeah, that, that was one of the, the things I did not understand about image recognition when I started this, but the background makes a big difference. Um, and that's that's the reason why we need um, separate models for uh, different locations. Because um, you might think, well, if they've developed a, an Australian version, then surely it can already do possums and, and cats. Um, and it can, but it does them against the, the backdrop of an Australian eucalypt forest or an Australian desert or something, not not a, a New Zealand beach forest, and it, the background will will confuse it. So um, we have deliberately collected sample images from as, as wide a range of locations in New Zealand as possible. So we've got beach forest, we've got um, dry land, we've got alpine. Um, so hopefully it'll be pretty robust, um, but there is also the, the potential to develop much more location-specific models. So you, you could um, develop a, a model specifically for Hawke's Bay, for example, or for Taranaki, or, um, and fine-tuned to the particular environments you get there. Um, and actually, that's something that I, I should have mentioned. We'll, we'll be making this artificial intelligence um, open source and freely available so people um, will be able to pick it up and run with it and modify it to their own purposes doing things like that. Um, why can I Warren, I like his name, I did ask uh, earlier about purchasing economical cameras but then um, Andy who must be uh, from the same area did say that Kapiti Coast Biodiversity Project has cameras you can borrow and I'm just interested to know as you go around the country is there a bit of this going on when our cameras are readily available to groups to borrow without costs involved? Mm. Oh, that, that's great to hear. Um, it's a suggestion that, that comes up all the time but that's actually the first time I've, I've heard of anybody actually going through with it and doing it so good good on them for, for doing that that's that's great um, and yeah I think it is a very good idea because um, often people have pools of, of cameras that they might only be using 10% of the time um, what, yeah why why shouldn't they be loaned out to, to other community groups or other research groups yeah brilliant idea yeah I think if anybody if anyone watching this is doing the same in their area or know of it, just write down here on the chat box and then others can take uh, take advantage of that. Um, there's an interesting one from Matthew. He said New Zealand, uh, and this is really just to get you a quick advice, a New Zealand Red Cross would like to use AI to evaluate cyclone damage in the Pacific Islands using UAVs. Um, can you just point that person um, into any experts who might like to donate their time and expertise to create this capability. Is that actually a, that, that a doable thing? 
Is this where it's going to all go as well? I'm, I'm sure that would be a doable thing. Um, yeah, it, it, again, as, as I say, I'm, I only have a layperson's understanding of, of artificial intelligence, but from, from what I do understand of it, um, it, it can recognise almost anything as long as you train it to do so. So if you had example images of the type of cyclone damage you're looking for, um, and lots of them, um, yeah, I, I don't doubt that it could learn to do that. Um, yeah, I, I can't um, think of any names right off the top of my head as to who might be able to help with that, but I can certainly find some names if I if I go back through some old emails. So perhaps if the if the person that asked that question would like to get in touch with me, I'll I'll try and uh, point them in the right direction. And while we've got that, can you give us just an indicator of how we do get in touch with you? Absolutely, yep. So um, I'm on Twitter at uh, AS underscore Glenn, um, or you can email me at Glenn A, so it's G-L-E-N-A, at landcareresearch.co.nz. In fact, am I able to, to type it into this chat box? Can I? That'd be easy, yeah, wouldn't absolutely. it? Yeah, there yeah, we go. Yeah, I'll just well, do you that. Can. Oh, this is fantastic. And I'll be able to ask you another question at the same time <laughs> if you can multitask. Um, Graham from Deleted Seabirds has sent one in saying, do you want sets of pics that have been ID'd of sooty shearwaters? Where's your mark? Uh, yeah, that would that would be that would be fantastic. So that they've already been processed. Yeah. Would love them. Yeah, please send Here's them to that, Graham, that email that I just put up. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Graham, uh, which is cool. Um, also, Marcus uh, says Auckland Council uh, lends cameras to groups and individuals. So this is the, oh, an great. area that uh, people are picking up on quickly, uh, which is cool. I had a personal one for you here. I hope you don't mind. Just this, this is mainly for any schools that might be watching. Um, have you seen any images that you've got incredibly excited about? So basically, you've... <laughs> and your time. What have you seen that you've got? They, they do what? Mm, Any of those? Yeah. And I mean to do with the, uh, yeah, the creatures that you're seeing. Yeah, you get some funny ones. Um, in fact, a, a few years ago, um, I was interviewed for the, the Telly News with a. They did a, uh, a little piece that they called Animal Selfies, um, and we we included a few examples in that. So you might still be able to find it if you Google Animal Selfies. Um, and it, there were some pretty amusing images on on there, um, but yeah, you catch animals getting up to all sorts of funny stuff. But w one of the most surprising things we've found is a, I mentioned that ferret body odor lure um, that that we use, and yeah, you know, not surprising that ferret odor is attractive to other ferrets. But what's really amazing is how attractive it is to um, things that get eaten by ferrets, like like rats and hedgehogs. Um, you get them climbing all over the the plastic pottle that's got the lure inside it um rolling on their backs sometimes they look as though they're trying to mate with it um it's just <laughs> astounding um yeah you get animals getting up to all sorts of crazy shenanigans yep um inga has asked ferret versus stoat odor effectiveness question mark mm. uh we haven't done any direct comparisons. Um, I, I know other people have been working with stoat odour and it, it's very good for specifically for other stoats, but um, I'm not sure how good it is for attracting in other species. Um, yeah, I think I think the direct comparisons are, are yet to be done. But it, one, one important thing with um, predator management though is to vary your lures anyway so I, I would suggest that people should probably you know try them both at various different times or at, or at different traps because one, one animal might be interested in one lure and another animal might be diff might be interested in another um karen asks how do you get hold of ferret uh odor lures yep um so uh patrick garvey who's my my colleague at Manaki Fenua down in, in Lincoln um, is working on 
making a, a synthesized version of it, which we'll be able to mass produce. Um, but in, in the meantime, um, he's just producing it the old fashioned way, which is by getting ferrets to, to sleep on bits of toweling. And then um, once they've slept on it for a good few weeks, you, you just use that toweling. Um, and that's, that's available uh, for sale through Manaki Fenua. Um, so again, if, if uh, people want to get in touch with me, I can put them on to the, the lady who, who um, deals with that. Um, somebody's actually come in and said they've trained AI to recognise wasps and bees so that rats and mice should be possible. So um, a lot of people, mm. a lot of people really getting into this area, aren't they? It's getting the more and more people are getting involved with you. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's it's um, it's a really quite a rapid growth field, um, and I, I hadn't heard that about wasps and bees, but I'm yeah, I'm not surprised. It, it can it can pick up on really quite subtle differences um yeah it's it's an amazingly powerful tool well it's been great having you today um it sounds to me like there's probably going to be a few people that will want to contact you with technical questions that relate to their own projects just mm -hmm. to finish off we always like to give a bit of a, a, a moment for someone like yourself to maybe just um talk about the whole predator free uh, this New Zealand wide um, thing that's going on, so many more people getting involved, the people that watch these webinars. Um, anything you want to end on saying to that group, as in, you know, just the importance of them? And uh, just, it's always nice coming from someone like yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're, you're right, more and more people are coming on board with Predator Free NZ, which I, I think is a fantastic thing you know people are describing it as New Zealand's Apollo project which I think is <laughs> um, quite a quite a quite a nice analogy I mean it's um, far far more useful achievement than, than flying to the moon if you ask me um, <laughs> and yeah what would I say to people I'd say uh, keep fighting the the good fight we, we don't um, we don't have the the tools and knowledge at our disposal yet to achieve a predator free New Zealand. But um, if you look back 30 years, we didn't know how to uh, eradicate predators even from small offshore islands. And now that, that's almost um, almost routine. So you know, just because we don't have the know-how at the moment doesn't mean we won't have the know-how in 20 or 30 years from now. So yeah, I, I think it's a, a fantastic aspiration and keep up the good work, everybody. And thanks very much for giving your time and uh, educating us a bit more on what sounds like an incredibly exciting thing. And the great thing is it's available now uh, in different shapes and forms for the um, people who are out in the field. Yeah, that's right. Um, and as I say, hopefully, hopefully in the very near future, um, widely available free of charge. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It's certainly going to save me a lot of time. <laughs> Absolutely. Al, it's been great to have you. Thanks so much. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much for having me.